So panel two, um, it's called Innovating Regulations, Finding and Designing Better Policy Solutions. And uh, our panelists include Seth Orenberg, Christopher John Springman, uh, Peter Van Valkenburg, and we have uh, one of Chris's co-authors who joined us um, as well. And our moderator is uh, Paula Suarez, and I will, uh, who is a, a visiting assistant professor of economics at uh, State University of New York Purchase, and a fellow with uh, NYU, uh, with Classical Liberal Institute at NYU School of Law. So I will let her take over um, to start this panel. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Leah. So welcome to the second panel. Um, we're going to start uh, with Seth Orenberg's presentation first. Uh, he's assistant professor of law at Duquesne University, and he previously taught courses at the Chicago Kent College of Law and Florida State University College of Law. His research spans crowdfunding, crowdfunding venture capital and angel investing, and smart contracts and network effects. Um, so you can go ahead. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today about the impact of regulation on innovation and how to design better policy solutions. And thanks also to a generous grant from the Sir John Templeton Foundation. Leah and I had the privilege of interviewing over 100 founders, funders, and other market participants in over a dozen U.S. cities, plus Tel Aviv, Ranana, and Jerusalem in Israel, uh, to learn what types of regulations enable innovation and which stifle it. I spoke to venture capitalists and angel investors, managers of startups and incubators, uh, uh, dozens of founders in key startup industries, including FinTech, life sciences, software, lawyers, academics. We talked to a lot of people. And uh, what I'm going to share with you today are uh, my preliminary observations from this research. Although our qualitative analysis is ongoing and our quantitative study is going to launch soon, I would like to share three core observations about regulatory impact on entrepreneurship and innovation that I have made through this work so far. And uh, today I will present to you then these three concepts, and by the way, I haven't published them yet, so just don't, don't rip me off, okay? <laughs> All right, so uh, the three concepts in short are going to be, and I have little hand signs so you remember them, right? Regulatory resolution, regulatory partnerships, and the geometry of regulation. So those are gonna be the three themes. The, the first one, uh, we know from the literature that uh, regulatory cost and regulatory uncertainty are distinguishable. But a more novel observation is that, uh, what I learned from interviewees is that some entrepreneurs may actually prefer more costly paths compared to more uncertain ones, provided they have greater uh, resolution as to how much that regulation will cost and how long it will take them to trod that path. Uh, the second, point uh, that we probably recognize intuitively is overregulation can result in non-compliance uh, and uh, potentially even willful ignorance. But pre-compliance assistant programs and partnerships, regulator, regulated working partnerships can transform this relationship. And the third observation uh, is that regulations can impact startups in different ways depending on the shape of that regulation. I'm drawing a cost curve here. The, I call this the geometry of regulation. And uh, asymptotic regulations with high initial costs or discontinuous regulations with discrete costs at certain intervals have a disproportionately negative impact on startups. Uh, <clears throat> flatter regulations are therefore better for innovation. So let's then go back to that first point and just distinguish cost versus uncertainty. Most regulations incur some of both. Most regulated uh, companies incur both cost and uncertainty. For example, Lyft just went public, and we know that they paid uh, $308,789 in SEC fees. That's a calculated number. They knew that's how much it would cost. It was mathematically determinable. But what they didn't know is how much it would cost to pay the lawyers. Turns out we charge by the hour, and we tend not to give uh, rack rates for transactions like this. So an IPO has some amount of regulatory uncertainty. It has some amount of lack of resolution. But initial coin offerings, as I'm sure my co-panelists will say more about, has far less regulatory resolution. The SEC has provided very little guidance on how cryptocurrencies are regulated, and the fintech companies I spoke to are generally frustrated by the lack of regulation, actually asking for regulation and clarity to regulation. To put it another way, ICOs have a lower regulatory resolution than IPOs. Uh, and for want of a clear regulatory box to fit in, many startups in crypto and otherwise fail 
for this lack of resolution. I spoke with an entrepreneur in Denver who set out to innovate in small business lending, and there was no clear path for her innovation. She wanted to help local businesses access peer-to-peer -peer lines of credit. But no one had attempted this before. There was no clear pathway. And so she had a very difficult time raising money from venture capitalists, convincing them that this would work because the regulatory resolution was so low they couldn't see the path forward. They did not know what bucket to put the company in and the company almost failed as a result. Earlier today, uh, Ryan Pierce pointed out how existing medical technology devices were grandfathered in in 19. 76, and he explained the substantial equivalence test better than I can, quite frankly. And the value of being substantially equivalent to an existing technology, about having a well-trodden path, gives that regulatory resolution. I spoke with the CEO and founder of a biotech company in San Diego about his experience in going to market with a new technology for kind of blood sensor. It's really cool technology. It can actually measure what's in your blood without piercing the skin. Uh, kind of like an adhesive bandage that has this diagnostic feature. Now, being a diagnostic, it's a regulated medical device. And he actually faced a choice. It could be regulated as either a class two or a class three device. And if you just read the literature, you would think that class two would be preferable. It's less burdensome. In fact, the SEC's website says that regulatory control increases from class one to class three. But this CEO elected the costlier, but higher resolution regulatory path, chose the class three process because it would give investors a clear idea based on precedent, how many dollars and how many hours the company would have to invest to obtain FDA approval. A class two pathway, on the other hand, was totally untried. It was not sure how many trials it would take to run or how long it would take and how much the burn would be. Likewise, the class three uh, timeline was more certain. So the more expensive but more certain regulatory pathway was more attractive to investors, provided a clearer go-to-market strategy which uh, helped the company succeed. And it wasn't the only reason to choose a well-trodden path. According to this startup, it did not necessarily want to forge a new path in class two. If the startup obtained an FDA clearance in class two, then the next startup would be able to follow its well-trodden path. It would have benefited the following startup. It would have taken the cost of dealing with the regulatory uncertainty and effectively bushwhacked through the process, carving a path with greater regulatory resolution for potential uh, com competitors in the future. We also heard about several managers talk about cost versus uncertainty with regard to 1099 versus W-2. That's the worker versus the employee versus independent contractor debate. Every worker has to be classified in one of these two ways, although I've written about why there should be a third way. And it's cheaper and easier to hire a 1099, uh, but a spat of lawsuits have raised some doubt as to whether that classification will stick or whether those workers will be reclassified as employees, resulting in a number of costs, including back taxes. The Labor Department has not provided clear guidance on these roles. There's a lack of regulatory clarity around the distinction and a prominent investor emphasized that, quote, a lack of sophistication and reliance on Google law when it comes to employees versus independent contractors is a problem, end quote. As a result, many startups employ people as W-2s, even though they are probably 1099s. They prefer to pay the regulatory cost instead of facing regulatory uncertainty. Other interviewees actually said the opposite, though, that they could not afford this regulatory cost. And because they were not able to get clarity, they would simply avoid learning about the law and pursue a path of willful indifference and potentially deliberate violation of the law, which leads to the second point. When the costs of uh, regulation and rules are either too high or simply too confusing, startups will practice willful ignorance or deliberate noncompliance. We spoke to a number of founders who said they do not even bother to learn about regulations because they figure they can't afford to pay them anyway. So why spend the legal costs to learn what these unaffordable regulations are? Obviously, I can't give specific examples here because the startup spoke with us on condition of anonymity, but many of these interviewees said they try to fly under the radar for as long as possible, avoiding any registration, any regulation to avoid being identified by regulators causing a culture of noncompliance around these young startups. 
And apparently, New York City here is one of the worst over-regulators for startups. Many of the New York City startups we spoke with in particular said that once they received any sort of public funding, filed a Form D, which means they got some venture financing, or any sort of business license, they immediately became uh, recipients of uh, somewhat threatening letters claiming they had failed to pay employment tax and things like that. Some interviewees even said they were receiving claims that they owed tens of thousands of dollars in employment tax when they had no employees. Yet they had to pay tens of thousands of dollars regardless to retain lawyers or fight the city regardless. They expressed a common perception that these regulations were, quote, unfair and mafia-like, a shakedown, and not in keeping, uh, end quote, and not in keeping with New York City's promise to be startup friendly. But this negative relationship is not always and does not have to be the case. Regulatory, regulator, regulated partnerships can solve some of these problems. In Pittsburgh, we spoke to the CEO of a materials science company. They told us about an OSHA compliance program whereby they'll send a representative to your facility for free. They will walk through your facility, tell you how you're out of compliance, give you a checklist of how to fix it for free, and then give you a grace period where there'll be no penalties if you fix within that window. This CEO said that this program makes regulatory compliance less costly possible and even gave them a feeling that they were partners with the regulators, partners for safety of their employees. It really changed the dynamic from a cat and mouse game to a regulator regulated partnership. And by the way, this material science uh, company rents space from the University of Pittsburgh at a facility called U Park. And Pitt helps its startups by offering these facilities, these shared facilities that already comply with certain regulations. Some of those costs are then shared among many startups. Due to Pitt's ongoing efforts and working relationship with organizations like OSHA, the company found regulatory compliance to be, as they reported, easy. And then this leads to the third point about uh, the shape of regulation and the ability to share and diffuse costs over a large number of startups in order to make innovation competitive. The shape of regulation really matters. Interviewing some of the entrepreneurs are, uh, really helped us see how there could be incredibly high costs up front to startups. And that led me to develop a new theory I call the geometry of regulation. It goes something like this. Regulations come in three basic shapes. They can be linear, as in a tax of 1% on every unit sold. They can be logarithmic or asymptotic, where the initial cost is very high, but the average cost decreases over time, or they can be discontinuous, where regulatory cost increases at specific intervals. It should come as no surprise that in our research, discontinuous regulations create market distortions right around discontinuity. I spoke with the director of a small bank in Chicago about how the Dodd-Frank regulations on reporting requirements uh, basically mean that a, a company with $10 billion in assets, I know it sounds like a lot, but that's relatively small for a bank, has to comply with various stress tests to avoid being too big to fail and manage risk. The director explained that this basically made it impossible to have an $11 billion bank. And we see that there are very few $11 billion banks. There are $9.99 billion banks and $49.99 billion banks, right? So we have these distortions in the size of banks at the edges of the discontinuous regulation. Because on a cost per dollars basis, it doesn't make sense to have an $11 million bank. This regulation, by the way, really troubles me because it was intended to protect depositors, but it has the unintended consequence of effectively destroying these mid-sized banks. The smaller ones tend to be acquired by larger ones, leading to a lack of opportunity on the one hand and oligopoly on the other. It creates the too big to fail, or at least encourages the too big to fail problem it sought to prevent. Electronic medical records and HIPAA compliance are another good example of these logarithmic or asymptotic regulations. Compliance is a huge cost for solo doctors. Some reports and several interviewees said it cost a solo doctor $40,000 to comply with HIPAA and, and electronic medical records. But a hospital can do this for 600 doctors for two million. That means that HIPAA compliance is 10 times more expensive, 10 times more expensive for a solo practitioner than a hospital. It may be one reason why we have seen the decline of these small practices. GDPR is another example. GDPR is European Union's new sweeping data protection law. I spoke to dozens of startups who are not sure how to comply with these regulations. They're hundreds of pages long. But startups, and here we're going to talk about now bending that asymptotic curve, startups will use Amazon Web Services. 
And Amazon Web Services complies with GDPR. So if you have uh, your, your product, software as a service, on AWS, you are GDPR compliant without having to learn the regulations, without having to buy the equipment. And while AWS may pass this cost along to users, <coughs> they pay as you go. And what's critical here is we see how the shape of regulation changes from an asymptotic cost curve to a linear one as these companies pay for GDR compliance as they use it. <coughs> Chris may say more about the privacy regulations that are similar to GDPR and how they impact uh, innovation. Startups may even have opportunities for flattening the cost curve and thereby innovating by changing the structure of the regulatory cost. One founder in particular told us about his product, uh, going back to HIPAA compliant email, that he makes available to doctors on a per email basis. So doctors don't have to spend $40,000 up front to have compliant EMR. They can simply use this turnkey solution and they are compliant with the law on a monthly subscription or a pay per use basis. This startup transforms the steep and sometimes unaffordable cost curve for HIPAA compliance and EMR per physician into a linear curve that allows small companies to compete. This type of private innovation can dull the impact of public regulations that would otherwise create unnatural monopolies and distort the economy toward the larger companies at the expense of the smaller. And the firm that creates these solutions is able to capture part of the value it creates. So in summary, I've identified three phenomena about the impact of regulation regarding regulatory resolution, how clear the regulations are, not necessarily how much they cost, but how well they are understood. The regulator-regulated partnerships that can help with pre-compliance programs, which both help clarity and change the relationship and the way startups think about regulators. And finally, this geometry of regulation, the idea that there are different cost curves and the ability to soften those curves or make them more linear can be very beneficial for innovation and entrepreneurship. A clear regulatory cost is something that can be readily solved. Investors are prepared to spend money surmounting these type of regulatory hurdles. In fact, once the cost is paid, it serves as a barrier to entry for competitors and thus can actually represent a competitive advantage to startups and their investors. Venture capital investors may actually prefer regulated companies for this reason. But they do not prefer, as reported by them, uncertainty. Uncertainty is a cost that is difficult for startups to bear because if you don't know if something will cost one million or a hundred million and you're a small startup, you aren't able to absorb those cost changes as well as a much larger firm. Regulators can achieve their policy objectives through stronger regulated regulator Partnerships, these pre-compliance programs I mentioned, are just one way for regulators to encourage compliance and increase regulatory resolution. But of course, it's only applicable when the regulators are sincerely interested in helping startups grow and not trying to shake them down or protect entrenched interests of incumbent firms. All regulation can impact entrepreneurship, but discontinuous and asymptotic regulation has a particularly devastating effect on innovation. Accordingly, regulators should think about how to make regulations more linear or at least make it possible for private firms to co-locate, share resources, or otherwise bend that cost curve, making an asymptotic curve more linear so that they can compete with larger, larger firms from a regulatory cost perspective. So with that, thank you for the opportunity to share with you these preliminary observations. Further study is, of course, needed, and I hope our forthcoming quantitative startup study will provide empirical support for these findings. Great, thank you, Seth. <laughs> Um, okay, so next is going to be, we're going to hear from Peter Van Valkenberg. Uh, he is the Director of Research at the Coin Center, which is the leading nonprofit research and advocacy group for um, focused on public policy issues related to cryptocurrency technology, such as Bitcoin. He has testified on these issues before Congress and briefed staff and members of the EU Parliament, and he's a graduate of NYU Law and was previously a Google Policy Fellow. Um, Thanks, Paula. Um, I do have some slides, so I was going to awkwardly mm -hmm. stand up. Um, so I um, come to talk about a specific type of disruptive technology rather than looking at a broad survey. Um, but unlike some of the other, you could say, industry or startup representatives that we saw in previous panels today, I work at a nonprofit. 
I don't work at a startup, and there's an actual uh, sort of foundational reason related to the technology why that's the case and why I think it's an interesting perspective. Um, cryptocurrencies have startups. There are some very successful startups like Coinbase uh, or Circle or Gemini, the, the Winklevoss's uh, recent effort. Um, but the foundational technology of cryptocurrency and open blockchain networks is not owned by any one company, be it a, a large um, incumbent company or be it a startup. It's open source software running on computers all over the world. It, the metaphor is now a bit overused. Um, I think Mark Andreessen was one of the first to say, I see in Bitcoin what I saw on the internet in 1996. So the metaphor to the internet is a little overused, but it's accurate in a foundational way that like the internet, there, there are several stakeholders, several persons building the technology, and the technology itself is a, a public good. It's, it's like infrastructure, rather than being one particular proprietary idea or business model. Um, so who are the actors then? I mentioned that there are startups like Coinbase, but who else is there that might be subject to regulation? Well, first and foremost, there are software developers. So just like the internet protocols, um, TCP IP, SMTP, uh, HTTP all had authors for those specifications and the software that had to be written as either a reference client or actually a client. Um, these networks have software authors at their beginning. So the way the Bitcoin network works is people out there who wanted to find a way to have private currencies or immutable ledgers to, to reach agreement over the internet over, over the movement of valuables said, okay, I think I have an idea how to write this, and they just wrote the code and released it to the world. And then other people picked it up, and maybe some of the same people, but maybe completely unaffiliated people as well, picked it up and ran it on their commonly available hardware. Now today there's more specialized hardware involved, but again, it's just stuff. It's just computers running software. So it starts with the software developers, and the choices that they make have really grave consequences uh, or good consequences for how people then interact with cryptocurrency networks. Um, but it's done open source, so these people don't enforce their copyright. They, in fact, use copyleft licensing to make sure that nobody can enforce copyright or patent over the foundational technology, the software. So then there's users of these networks, and these, more often than not, this, this is a, a retail consumer play originally. There's lots of talk of using blockchain for big business. I think a lot of it is actually hot air. Uh, some of it will be real, um, but mostly right now this is a consumer play. The idea is that people might want to be their own bank sometimes, and using nothing but software and a computer, they might be able to do that. So users could be the targets of regulation, and of course they're also what we're regulating for more often than not when it's consumer protection or investor protection. Not necessarily when it's anti-money laundering, another obvious area of regulatory um, intersection with these technologies. Then there's the actual network itself that the users are interacting with. So these are those people that I said, take the free and open source software from developers who were just building it because they're interested, or maybe financially incentivized to do so. They take the software from those people and they run it on computers around the world. And those computers are now a little bit more specialized like this Bitcoin uh, mining farm, um, but it could also just be a home computer. And home computers still actually do play a pretty foundational role in the network, just relaying transactions, not necessarily mining blocks. And I, I promise not to use too much jargon like that, but there are big computers and there are small computers in this network. And then there are the lumpy intermediaries who, if you don't want to interact directly with the network, so run the software on your phone or your home computer to send Bitcoin or receive Bitcoin from other people in the world, you could basically hire a company to do it for you. They're rather like a, a bank where you'd keep your cash because you don't want to keep it in a mattress. So there still are these intermediaries in this world. They're just not essential. And the regulatory issues here are fairly obvious in that most financial services regulation, whether it's the SEC's rules, whether it's the OCC or the other banking regulators' rules, whether it's money laundering rules, they typically are rules that are enforced by using a regulated financial intermediary who's powerful on the network to create the policy outcome that we want. Collect information about your customers for anti-money laundering purposes. Make sure you have minimum capital requirements for solvency, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if an intermediary might exist, like an exchange, like Coinbase, 
Um, but it also might not exist. So using that intermediary as a sort of deputized target for policy is suddenly not as guaranteed of a solution to reach the policy ills that you're trying to address through regulation. And then finally, there are promoters. Um, this is uh, Floyd Mayweather, who really wanted people to use a certain new cryptocurrency that was sort of uh, a derivative innovation, if you will, from Bitcoin. So uh, quick, brief cryptocurrency history lesson. Bitcoin was developed by someone we don't even really know who they are. It was somebody published a paper and published open source software, and then they kind of disappeared after only a year, or about two years, um, of being actively involved. Other people who see Bitcoin and say, okay, well, I'd, I'd kind of like to build something like that, have not necessarily always been so anonymous. And they've not always been so willing to just sort of give up their creation. Often they want to raise money from the general public on the sort of hype of, I'm gonna build a better Bitcoin. And this is the ICO craze that we saw. This is um, what Seth was referring to as, uh, it's an alternative way to do basically equity crowdfunding. Um, although the SEC is not totally clear on that, but I actually think the SEC is pretty clear on that now. Uh, and we might talk about the guidance that they released yesterday a little bit later, but I don't want to get bogged down immediately. So then there are these promoters who not only are they playing a role maybe in the network or writing the software, they're doing something very different also. They're taking money from people on the promise of building a better network. And you could be multiple of these different actors, so we could lay them all out like this. Developers, miners, users, intermediaries, and promoters. You could be both a developer and a promoter. You're promoting the thing that you developed. You could also just be a developer, though. I know several of the Bitcoin core developers who just, they're usually independently wealthy because they had Bitcoin early. But they don't advocate for people to use Bitcoin. They don't run a business. They just sit and they love the technology, so they write, they, they patch bugs in the source code as they see them, or they propose new changes. It's really quite interesting. So hard to characterize them as a promoter. Easy to characterize them just strictly as a software developer. I want to check my time. Oh, pretty good. And so if these are the potential regulated parties, um, who are the regulators? And what are their regulatory approaches? So I want to build a spectrum here just to help you understand what we've seen at Coin Center for the last four years and also hopefully offer a little bit of insight into different approaches, at least as they could apply to cryptocurrency, but maybe just as they could apply to regulating innovative technologies generally. So my spectrum's gonna go from full-on private ordering, which is like a polite company way of saying anarchy and the free market, uh, although even that's a contentious distinction because can you have uh, anarchy if there's property rights? I, we're not gonna go there. <laughs> but so the invisible hand, it's a way of regulating. It is. Um, I'm losing the, using the term uh, regulatory very broadly. And interestingly, in the cryptocurrency space and in a lot of software development space, sometimes people try and get themselves into this category of regulation and out of the other categories of regulation by making arguments that all they're doing is something that's constitutionally protected and therefore any regulation of that activity would face strict scrutiny review and be likely found unconstitutional. Now to do that, you have to prove that what you're doing really is just speech. Can't be conduct, can't be expressive conduct necessarily, which might get protections, but of course under intermediate scrutiny and in the software cases, that usually means the regulation is constitutional. But this is an interesting mechanism or sort of dynamic that we see in this space. Someone who's really just writing Bitcoin core software and posting it to a public repository on the internet and not claiming copyright, not claiming any kind of IP, and not even running a business, they're just writing this software is doing something fairly similar to just publishing uh, a paper or a textbook. In fact, you could write the source code in plain text and publish it as a book if you wanted. And so this is a touchy thing for people in the space who are brushing up against not just the Taxi and Limousine Commission, but the gosh damn SEC, you know? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it, it's maybe not an exact syllogism in that you've got a much more heavy duty regulator and quite possibly much more heavy duty consequences if you cross the SEC. So what are regulators thinking about this? This is, I think, what's happening right now. I'm gonna go into history a little bit in the next few sections, but this constitutional law issue is finally coming to a head because regulators are concerned about the emergence of so-called smart contracts, 
which are programs that run on these blockchain networks that do things for people, and they might do illegal things. So there's a series of smart contracts, for example, that you can run on the Ethereum network that creates a prediction market where people can bet on future events and where there's actually a trustworthy oracle to make sure that the people who accurately predicted get paid and the people who failed to predict pay. And that oracle is actually just a, a robot that basically solicits votes from a population of people on the network who want to maintain their reputation as truth sayers. But they're all just pseudonymous. They don't actually have human names. They don't interact with each other in a room. They have no contracts between each other of the legal formal sense. They're not in privity with each other. They're just people using software on the internet together to run a prediction market. Well, running prediction markets, unless you're an academic institution and severely limiting the amount of liquidity, is illegal in the US. <laughs> and it's CFTC regulated. So if there's these smart contracts out there and they're really not running with an intermediary, who is the regulated party? Could we hold the author of that software responsible for putting this thing into the world that people then use to, to basically violate the law? And the CFTC, uh, Commissioner Contends, uh, in a speech in Dubai last summer said, if people can reasonably foresee that their software is gonna be used for crime, then maybe they should be held accountable. And to Commissioner Quintens's credit, uh, he said, this is just something I'm noodling with. I want feedback on this. And so Coin Center reached out uh, to Commissioner Quintens, the organization I work with. We're an independent nonprofit um, advocacy organization. We said, surely it just a reasonably foreseeable standard can't be sufficient because take traditional derivatives law where, or, or markets where you have form agreements like the ISDA master agreement for commodity swaps, which are promulgated, promulgated by international organizations like ISDA, of course, they could reasonably foresee someone's gonna take that form agreement and fill in their names and they're not authorized contract participants perhaps, and they're gonna use that agreement to violate the law. So ISDA would be accountable by that standard. And it's really no different with someone who writes a smart contract software that could be used to make a prediction market but could also be used for multiple legal purposes, just to do a simple swap of something unregulated on these, on these networks. And uh, Commissioner Quintens actually wrote a blog post on our website um, after we discussed it with him and said, yeah, you're absolutely right. We need to work on what the standard of liability is and reasonable, foreseeable, probably too low a bar. What is the bar? Is it intent and knowledge to commit crime? I don't know. But this is, so this is unfolding. Just in this first area of regulatory approaches, this sort of uh, anarchic, uh, market regulated, and maybe constitutionally protected area. The next area, um, good old fashioned common law, private law. Um, there's aren't, there aren't contracts. Some smart contracts might be contracts, but that might even be a stretch. Uh, in general, you're not in privity with the person who invented the Bitcoin software and then you decided to run it and then you didn't know what you were doing so it hurt you. So contracts is, a, is an awkward area with respect to open source software projects and decentralized networks because it's hard to establish contract. Um, what about tort? This seems actually quite ripe for tort. Um, this is relationships between strangers where maybe a duty is involved or, or not. The interesting thing about this, from my perspective, and I, I just had the pleasure of speaking to my former torts professor, um, Catherine Sharkey, uh, earlier today, is that negligence torts, in general, there's something called the economic loss rule, which says if, if your damages from somebody's potential breach of a duty are purely economic, and there was no property damage, like tangible physical property damage, and no physical harm, you were barred from claiming. Now that doesn't apply to intentional torts, so of course we can reach this stuff when there's fraud, but what if somebody just negligently designed a cryptocurrency? The economic loss rule, if it holds, and different states have different opinions, and I recommend both of um, Professor Sharkey's articles that she published recently on this topic. It, it holds in some states, it holds less in other states. The economic loss rule would basically just wipe this whole area of regulation off the map with respect to these technologies. And that's not necessarily a good thing, even if you're someone like me who advocates for these technologies, because a, a sensible negligence-based tort regime 
might be a good way to hold developers accountable if the alternative is a command and control top-down regulatory structure that misunderstands the very technology that it's regulating because government always lags. But this is off the table unless we find some way to get rid of the economic loss rule. Other regulatory approaches. Uh, I want to briefly discuss, oh good, still time. I want to briefly discuss the SEC. So this is getting into the territory of command and control regulation, but I put it next in my spectrum from sort of anarchic to full public uh, or full government control because the interesting thing about the SEC is it's an old, an old regulatory body whose organic statute, the 33 Securities Act and the other Securities Act, has this flexible test for what could be a security. Um, and it's flexible because there's an undefined term, investment contract, amidst the list of things that are securities like equities, debts, et cetera. There's investment contract. And the courts, through a sort of organic process that's very much like common law, have come up with a test for when your thing is an investment contract. And this is the Howey case. It's about an orange grove in Florida in the 1940s, which is pretty remarkable that we're still talking about an orange grove when we're talking about something like Ethereum or a cryptocurrency. But this is actually the great thing about bubbling up common law, and I know this is sort of statutory law, but with a common law gloss, is that sometimes these things can be so flexible in establishing duties and establishing tests that they might be better than, than a bright line rule. And yet they create great uncertainty because until a court holds, we don't know exactly how the test is gonna come out. And the best we often get from regulators in the interval, which we got yesterday, and we wrote a blog post about it if you're curious, the SEC issued a framework for judging um, token sales, like the promoter in my earlier slide, um, we got a giant list of factors, like eight pages of factors. Like if you did this, it doesn't look good. If you did this, it doesn't look good. If you did this, it looks better. If you did... And none of them are determinative. They're all part of a facts and circumstances test um, because we have this flexible standard, which I'll throw it up real quickly. It's just a um, an investment contract is an investment of money in a common enterprise where uh, someone's led to expect profits derived solely from the efforts of a third party or promoter. There's a lot of room for interpretation in that, of course, and you've got three or four prongs, depending on how you look at it, that you have to meet or not meet. So kind of common law-like, which means flexible, but also means uncertainty. Next. Um, I want to talk briefly about anti-money laundering law because this is, this is more of the rules versus standards version of sort of statutory regulatory structures touching cryptocurrency. Because there's no flexible test for what is a money services business and therefore regulated under the Bank Secrecy Act, which means they need to know their customers and do suspicious activity reporting and all these sorts of costly obligations in order to catch people laundering money through the financial system. It's a bright line rule, and it's actually a bright line rule in the statute that, <laughs> that also allows the Secretary of Treasury to add to the definition of what is a financial institution. So it used to just be banks and a few other bank-like entities. Now it's all sorts of things, including casinos and precious metal dealers, because the Secretary of Treasury, through rulemaking, has added to the definition. So we end up looking to the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR, for more new bright line rules. The courts aren't adjudicating this, it's, it's really just do you fit the definition? And the definition is uh, the term money transmission services means the acceptance of currency funds or other value that substitutes for currency from one person and the transmission of currency funds or other value that substitutes for currency to another location or person by any means. That, like, that could be anything. And I've even spoken to some folks at FinCEN and they say, yeah, that's the point. And then there's a facts and circumstances sort of limitation. So almost everyone is probably a money transmitter. Like if I, if I give Professor Rizzo $5 and tell him to give it to somebody else, he was a money transmitter for that brief period of time. But there's a facts and circumstances limitation. So this is incredibly sweeping and broad. And the, the open question for cryptocurrency is does it apply to miners? Does it apply to software developers? Who does it apply to in our landscape of persons? Does it apply to users? 
What if a user is just buying a lot of Bitcoin or selling a lot of Bitcoin on their own behalf, but because of that, they're basically making markets in it, which gets people onto or off of the protocol? Are they moving people's money from one location to another by engaging in their own personal transactions? I don't know. So that kind of bright line rule, while might provide some certainty um, or might not, is very inflexible as compared to, say, common law rules or, or even the Howey test from securities law. And finally, the last thing I want to talk about is um, what I put on the other end of the spectrum, things like bank charter regulation, where the, the genesis of this historically is you're prov providing a public function. So basically, you need to be a government-granted monopolist providing this function, and we will do a lot to dictate how you run your business. That's sort of the trade you get for doing this thing. And this is very top-down in structuring what a bank can do, how it can lend money or not lend money, minimum capital controls and things like this. But to me, the, 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 the interesting analogy here is also to what a lot of people are asking for, which is closer collaboration with the regulator. Like, I want the regulator involved in my business. I want to talk to them and have a personal relationship with them as if I'm a chartered, you know, quasi-entity of the state, if you will. And so a lot of people have celebrated the UK's Financial Conduct Authority's sandbox, uh, you know, financial innovation efforts where you can basically get a personalized relationship with your regulator. You get a, a binding compliance obligation that's both binding on you and the regulator. That means you don't have to do the normal things that people might have to do. You get a special brew of regulatory compliance strategies. And as long as you do that, you're safe. This sounds good and pro-innovation, but it's also rather abhorrent to the rule of law, if you think about it, because it's very incestuous, and it means every person, depending on how good their relationship is with the regulator, or maybe the regulator's more of a thug, it, 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 there's no generality, there's no um, transparency necessarily, the regulator doesn't have to treat everyone the same. I think this is actually an issue, even though a lot of people in my space are clamoring for sandboxes and, and special relationships with the regulator. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna wait till some slides appear. There they are. Yeah, um, okay. so now we will have uh, Christopher John Sprigman. Uh, he's a professor of law at NYU Law School. He teaches in intellectual property law, antitrust law, torts, and comparative constitutional law. He was also an appellate counsel in the antitrust division of the U.S. Department of Justice, and he previously clerked for Justice Stephen Reinhardt of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. And we are also joined by his co-author, who is a fellow at NYU Law, uh, Stefan Tantra. Okay, so this is joint work with Stefan, who's here very helpfully uh, to talk about this. And th this is pretty basic academic research about privacy regulation, and in particular, the structure of privacy regulation um, and how it can affect the outcomes that privacy regulation might give us for good or for ill. So um, there's an experiment here. I'll get into the experiment in a moment, but let me just try to frame uh, the paper and the motivation. So when we talk about privacy regulation, at least in the United States, we typically talk about it in terms of a notice and choice structure. That is, companies give notice of their privacy policies, consumers make choices whether to deal with that company, that counterparty, or not. Now, there are a couple of problems with this framing of privacy policy that are very much discussed at the moment. One of them, which has been beautifully elucidated by our NYU colleague, Florencia Morata Wugler, is that very few people actually read and understand privacy policies, and so notice and the consequent choice are often illusory. But, but there's a deeper problem, which uh, is what our paper kind of launches off of, and that's uh, uh, illustrated by these numbers. So if you've been following the Cambridge Analytica tale with Facebook, you might recognize these numbers. The 270,000 are the number of people who gave information to Cambridge Analytica. Um, and the 87 million are the number of people who unwittingly ended up giving information to Cambridge Analytica. And why is that? It's a combination of the kind of network structure of Facebook plus what appear to be the privacy rule, the, the, the Facebook privacy rule violations of Cambridge Analytica that allowed a relative, well, still an absolutely large number, but a relatively small number of people to basically create a privacy intrusion that inf affected millions and millions of people. 
Now that lays bare something about privacy that I think is foundational and that we're gonna have to deal with, and that is that privacy is a public good. Uh, privacy is not excludable, it's non-rival, and in fact, when any one person is making a decision about protecting his or her privacy, that person faces what economists would call externalities. That is to say that their decision, the individual's decision about whether or not to protect their privacy affects many potentially other people, as we saw in the Facebook Cambridge Analytica story. And that, that has real consequences. Ne externalities can be positive. For example, if you take some action to protect your privacy, that can actually protect the privacy of others. Externalities can also be negative. That is to say, if you make a decision to sacrifice your privacy, that can also lead to privacy losses suffered by others. This creates a big problem, which is incentives in the presence of externalities, individual incentives often fail. No one person has a perfect incentive to protect everybody else's privacy. Right? So it might be, and probably is the fact, that individuals are making privacy decisions in their own interest, not in the interest of others. This leads them potentially to underprotect privacy, uh, protect privacy at a level that's below what's socially optimal. Okay, so what do we do about this? Um, there's a couple of options. One is just ban particular transactions that have significant privacy implications. That's like the bluntest instrument possible. I don't think it'll ever get any traction. I, I, I mostly hope it won't get any traction. Option number two is to mandate particular privacy protections. And if you follow the discussion right now about privacy law, this is one of the major things that's being discussed. Mandate particular protections, particular protections for individual privacy that kind of align individual privacy decisions with the public good. Okay, so that's the idea. But is it that simple? Is it that simple? And I think the answer is pretty clearly no. And that's what our experiment is about. Think about how privacy decisions are made by individuals. They're often made in a low information environment. You don't know that much about the company you're dealing with or the person you're dealing with, especially online. And they're often made in an environment where the law is not particularly salient. And what does that mean? <clears throat> that means that privacy protections that are provided that are mandated by the law and provided by companies or counterparties, individuals, especially online, might be understood by the person exposed to them as coming not from the law, but coming from a decision made by that company or that person. And this can lead to a, a situation where privacy decisions are framed by individuals within what I'll call a framework of ascribed intention. I see that someone's providing me with some privacy protection, I assign the cause to their intention. I, I label them as a good party, right? I, it may be that the law requires it, that they have no choice, but I'm tempted to label them. So if that's the case, if I ascribe a positive intention to them, I'm more likely to disclose personal sensitive information. On the other hand, if I describe a ascribe a negative intention to them, so they, they fail to provide me with some type of protection that I think should be available, I might ascribe a negative intention to them and my willingness to disclose might go down. Now if you think of this framework, this poses a real problem. A mandate, a privacy protection mandate, might lead people to create positive ascribed intentions. That is to ascribe positive intentions to their online or even real world counterparty. And positive ascribed intentions might lead to disclosure actually more disclosure than the law or the lawmaker thinks is optimal. This might actually frustrate the point of the regulation in the first place. Okay, so Stefan and I decided to, to look at this and try to see if we could, through a structured experiment, um, try to show whether in fact this is the case or not, whether this framework is likely to happen. And we have a, a hypothesis um, which is that ascribed intentions and what we call the ascribed intention heuristic might drive privacy decisions for better or for worse. We'll get into that in a moment. And in fact, that this heuristic might lead to regulatory failure. Okay, so how did we investigate this? We did this through the aegis of a mixed lab field experiment. And I'm not gonna get too deeply into the uh, experiment itself, but just let me describe it in basic terms. So Stefan and I did another experiment about contracts, okay? And in this experiment, they uh, workers who were in Germany, they were students at a university in Germany, and some people who had graduated that university actually who we had in a subject pool, which Stefan is um, uh, the master of. Um, so this subject pool 
we, we, we came, we asked them to do a task which involved a, a number counting task. It's, it's a pure effort task, it's very boring. And we, we based an experiment on their performance in that task. We varied certain rules and they did this whole experiment. I don't need to go into the details, only to say that the experiment I'm about to talk to you uh, about now came at the end of that. When we were done, we gave them some choices about how they would get paid. And we varied the conditions under which they would make those choices. That was our experiment. That was the manipulation. And this is a nice little trick because in a sense we've mixed a kind of lab experiment with a field experiment. We get the controllability of a lab experiment, but our subjects don't know they're being manipulated. They think whatever manipulation happened is over and now we're just arranging payments. So there's, there's that sense of distance or detachment that characterizes a field experiment where we are not, at least visibly to them, intervening in anything, which, which I think is a nice um, feature of this. The, the, the experiment um, really focused on the payment options that we gave them. We, we constructed some privacy sacrificing payment options, and this is one of the reasons why we did it in Europe. Uh, Europe, which is actually very concerned with privacy compared to the US, has an extremely privacy sacrificing payment option that people use every day, which is they give you their banking information. And, and when they give you their banking information, you directly deposit things into their bank account. This is rarely done in the US. This is done all the time in Europe. And in fact, in many parts of the world, when I lived in South Africa, virtually every transaction I had was a direct deposit or a direct debit from my bank. And, that shocked me then, and it still kind of a little bit shocks me now. Anyway, so that was the privacy sacrificing payment option. The privacy preserving payment option was a little bit more complicated. What we did was we set up a system where you could get a code, and you could take that code to a building on the University of Münster campus called the Castle, which is a lovely building, and in there was a research assistant, but not the research assistant that administered the experiment, a different research assistant who had no idea what was in the envelope or why. You would give them the code, they would just hand you the money. So there would be no connection between you and the experiment, no connection between you and your choices in the experiment, very privacy preserving. Now note, however, that it's an enormous pain in the neck, right? <laughs> to go walk across campus to the castle to pick up your money is very much more inconvenient than just having it wired to your bank. So those were the choices we gave people. Um, so let me talk about experiment number one. Um, this was based around a, a series of treatments, and I'll start with our baseline treatment. And our baseline treatment went something like this. You completed the work we were asking you to do for the other experiment, and then we gave you a choice. We gave you a choice between the privacy sacrificing bank transfer or the privacy protecting anonymous. And we said to you, the law requires us to give you this choice. Okay, now why did we say that as our baseline? This is our control. We said that because by telling people that the law requires us to give you this privacy protecting choice, we mute the heuristic. We mute your ability to ascribe intention, whether positive or negative, to your counterparty because your counterparty has no choice. They have no action space. They have to give you the privacy protection. The law requires it. So that's our control. Okay, next treatment our bad intent treatment. So our bad intent treatment was we didn't give them the privacy protecting option. And we didn't tell them anything about what the law required. So now the subject we think is thinking, huh, they're requiring me to sacrifice privacy and they're not giving me an option to protect my privacy. I think that's a bad counterparty. I think I'm going to ascribe a bad intent to that person and we think disclosure, the willingness to disclose should go down. That's, that's what we think, we'll see. Um, next treatment, good intent, opposite, right? So now we don't tell you anything about what the law requires, we're silent about the law, but we give you the option of um, this privacy protecting anonymous payment method, and what we expect, and we'll see if it's true, uh, we expect the, the subject to say, oh, this is, a, this is someone who cares about my privacy. I think they're a good actor. I'm going to disclose, or I'm going to disclose at a higher level than I otherwise would. Let me tell you about one more condition. We call it expressive signal. And we, we put this in the experiment in, in response to a comment from our colleague, Florencia morata Wergler, who thinks a lot about privacy. This was a great contribution by her. Mm -hmm. So what we were worried about was that in our baseline condition, by telling people that the law required us to um, give them a privacy protecting option, we were basically speaking not just of what the law required, but what was good, right? So in other words, we were speaking to them about what they should want. 
And this could screw up our experiment because the, we, we needed to disentangle whether we were creating some kind of moral expectation in them about what was right by telling them that the law required us to provide this privacy protecting option. So in expressive signal, we did something a little different. We said to them, the law requires us to do this, but it actually doesn't apply to us because this experiment started before the law came into effect, but we're gonna do it anyway, right? So we gave them the signal about the law, but we exempted ourselves from it. And we're gonna see if that makes a difference in terms of overall performance. So let me give you a graph of overall performance. So let me get up and, and point. Uh, So here's our baseline. Sorry, wow, that's really loud. Here's our baseline. Um, <clears throat> that's where we told people that the law requires us to give them the privacy protecting option. Now, 68.2% uh, of people in our study gave us their bank account information in this condition. So think of that as our control. That's why we call it baseline. Look at bad intention. So that's where we did not give them the option of uh, a protective payment. Their, their willingness to disclose fell, so that's a statistically significant result compared to baseline. We get 60% or so of people now willing to give up their information. Still pretty high, we thought, but less. Look what happens when we construct a good intention framework, when we give them um, both the privacy protecting and the privacy sacrificing option, and we don't tell them that the law requires it. Their willingness to disclose goes way up as we predicted, right? This is a highly significant result, way above baseline. 92% of people in this condition give us their bank account information. And why is that? Because we created in them the conditions under which they could ascribe to us good intentions, and this would lead them to disclose. Look what happens with expressive signal. Nothing much. Right? There's no real difference between good intention and expressive signal. There is, however, a difference between expressive signal and baseline. But this suggests that the expressive quality of the law has a little effect, but not much. It's, it's really the counterfactual heuristic, right? This, this heuristic about ascribed intention that's doing most of the work. Okay, so we did a second experiment to follow up on this. And part of what we wanted to do with the second experiment is replicate the first one, right? So basic good social science hygiene. But we also wanted to test whether social cues, so actual information about trustworthiness, could have an effect that would mute or override the heuristic, the, the ascribed intention heuristic. So um, let me talk about what we did. So we did the same thing that we did before, the same conditions that we did before, but we added some conditions. We added a baseline condition with no positive social cues, meaning we stripped out all information about affiliation, university affiliation. And then we added a baseline with positive social cues. So we gave them all kinds of information about who we were, our academic work, right? Stuff that was designed to generate trustworthiness. Similarly, we had a good intent treatment with no positive social cues, so we stripped out all the social cues. And then we did a good intent treatment with positive social cues. So we added a bunch of social cues about our trustworthiness, you know, our academic record, our, our, um, our publications, stuff, stuff about us. Same thing with bad intent. We had a bad intent condition where we stripped out all the positive social cues, and we had a bad intent condition where we added a bunch more. Okay, so what do we see? So here, so bear with me, there's a lot of stuff here, but I'll go through it bit by bit. Let me go through the replication first. So the experiment replicates. Here's our baseline condition. Look at bad intent, right? If we construct a counterfactual where they ascribe to us bad intent, their willingness to disclose falls, and that's a statistically significant result. Look at good intent. If we construct a scenario where they can ascribe to us good intent, their willingness to disclose goes up, again, a statistically significant result. So we've replicated experiment one and experiment two with different subjects. Okay, what about the social cues? Take a look first at good intent. Here's good intent, the, just the flat, the, the kind of flat um, uh, treatment that we did the first time where we gave them some information about who we were, um, just basic information about who we were. Compare good intent with no information, that is we stripped out all the information about us. Good intent with positive information, that is we add lots of stuff about us to generate credibility. 
very little difference. There, there are little differences, but these are not statistically significant between good intent, good intent with positive information and good intent with no information. When people are employing the ascribed intention heuristic, even good information about credibility doesn't have much effect. Same thing if you look at bad intent. So look at bad intent here, bad intent with no information, that is where we stripped out information about who we were, bad intent with positive information, that is where we added information about who we were. They differ a little bit, but none of these differences are statistically significant. They are statistically identical. Okay, so again, when subjects are employing the ascribed intention heuristic, when they're thinking about our choices and then ascribing some intention to us, actual information about who we were and whether we'd be trustworthy has very little effect. Okay, here's the upshot. Take a look at baseline. Baseline, you might remember, mutes is designed to mute this ascribed intention heuristic because we tell people that the law requires us to do this. We eliminate our action space and so they can't ascribe an intent to us. What we give them in terms of privacy, we have to give them, right? So stripped of that ability to ascribe intention to us for good or ill, look what happens. Look at baseline no information versus baseline positive information. Okay, baseline positive information is statistically significantly different from baseline. If you give people positive information about us, they act on it all of a sudden, right? They disclose more because they find us trustworthy. The ascribed intention heuristic is muted. They're, that part of their brain switches off. What switches on is the rational part of their brain and they start thinking about whether we're trustworthy based on information we actually give them. Look at baseline no information when we strip out whatever information is there that could reflect on our credibility. Again, they can't rely on ascribed intention. That part of their brain switches off. Another part of their brain switches on. They start thinking about actual indicia of trustworthiness. They don't find any. And so their willingness to disclose goes down. Okay, so wh what are the implications of all this? I, th I think they're at least reasonably clear at a general level, although actually implementing them is gonna be tough. So first, design privacy regulation to mute the ascribed intention heuristic, because that is getting in the way. How to do that? Mandate disclosure of the legal source of the protection. Don't just require people to provide protections, require people to let their counterparties know that these protections are required by law, and not just because they're good people. Now that's gonna be tough, right? Because the same difficulty with salience that makes people ignore, for example, privacy disclosures is gonna to tend to make people ignore disclosures about the source of the protections that they're receiving. And so we have a real design problem. It's just a different design problem than we thought we had. All right, I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you. Um, we're going to take some questions now. You can uh, use the microphones on the side. Um, first, I had a question for Peter. Uh, you mentioned this briefly that the SEC yesterday published a digital asset guidance and interpretation for the Howey test. Um, I was wondering if you could discuss that a little bit more. Sure. So, sorry, that was loud. Very briefly, um, so this question of whether someone who's promoting a new cryptocurrency and maybe they took money from investors on a promise of delivering it in the future, whether they issued a security. And there's this flexible standards-based rule the Howey test that determines whether they fit into that category of regulated persons or not. And this has been something that the industry has sort of chafed with because they want a bright line rule. But the SEC doesn't give bright line rules on this kind of topic because they want to preserve their jurisdictional flexibility. They want to be able to reach, and this is a quote from the Howey case, all manner of schemes where people convince others to part with their money. So after about two and a half years since their first statements on this issue um, in summer of 2016, um, they finally issued this more formal guidance. There'd been a number of speeches. That's a, another interesting area that we see in this space. We see a lot of policy making through speeches. And there's a question of whether, you know, does the speech get, get, get deference from courts? Does it have any legal weight? Can you rely on it? 
usually know, but this is what's happening, just to fill the gaps, because there are so many damn gaps. So we've finally got this more formal guidance, although it's still just a staff memo. This isn't signed by the commissioners, this isn't anything like that. And as I said, it's just a list of factors that, that is an interpretation of the court cases, though, basically. It is an interpretation of that body of case law that established that flexible standard. So to me, that's actually something that's good about this. This isn't just completely arbitrary discretion of the regulator opining on something because you bothered them enough that they made a speech. They are forced to work within the architecture of the standards as they evolved in the common law courts for determining what a security is. They have to play by that game. And you could always check them on that game if they ever came after you by saying, you said this, and this is not just you saying this, this was your own interpretation of the case law, and we agree with that, and so you shouldn't have come after us. So it's interesting, but it's also not what the industry wanted. They wanted a bright line rule. And so when, when it came out, Coin Center wrote actually, a, a, I wrote a pretty uh, laudatory blog post analyzing it. And then we realized that there were a bunch of people from industry and we don't represent industry. So, and this is a good evidence of that, who said, wait a minute, you shouldn't be congratulating on them on this. This is more of the same. This is not binding. We want a bright line test. And my response is, I, I, I don't know. I don't think you do want a bright line test. Maybe you do. And I also think a lot of these things are, frankly, um, basically investment contracts. And you know, Bitcoin launched without anybody raising money. So maybe I'm just biased. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Thank and, you. And if I can add, this sounds a lot to me like the uh, guidance Department of Labor issued on 1099W2. So it's a 20-factor test, and none of them are dispositive, mm -hmm. and they were essentially unhelpful. Um, so I think in both these instances, you know, another approach that beyond a bright line rule is some type of safe harbor rule. So you can be subject to the factors or you can comply with a safe harbor. And I would think that's, I don't know, maybe out of what you're hearing from industry, but I would think industry would, would want at least a safe harbor opportunity. And so that would have to be statutorily created because it would cut off a lot of the SEC's current jurisdiction. So you'd need Congress to act, and uh, I, I wouldn't be too optimistic about that because most congressmen are just starting to learn about these technologies, let alone making policy there. And then the other thing I'd say is um, sometimes people talk about like the FCA's sandboxing authority in this regard, and that as long as you phone in with the regulator and build a path to compliance, and it doesn't have to be the black letter law obligations, you, you're safe. That's comforting to somebody but it's not gonna be comforting to a person who doesn't think they should be regulated in the first place. So why should they have to phone the regulator and, and, and commit to this intimate relationship where you sort of like invited the, the monster into your home maybe? Uh, so so it, it, it's, 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 it's tough. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I also have a question for uh, Christopher and Stefan. Um, you have a very interesting experiment. Um, I would only wonder about how if you think you have really isolated the signal of uh, muting the intentions by disclosing that this was mandated, um, it could be that that itself, the disclosure is interpreted, as you said, as something else. But I was also wondering if you could speak uh, more broadly about the seeming or apparent puzzle of privacy preferences by consumers who, in theory, or at least in their statements, seem to indicate very strong privacy concerns, and yet when you go to log into some new app that you want to use, you happily sign away all your information uh, and go on to post about your privacy concerns. Um, I was wondering if in your research you've um, come to any conclusions about that. Um, yeah, so the, um, uh, the privacy puzzle, that's, that's how we refer to it, um, the heuristic response to it, right? So the idea is that Way of, so there, there are a few theories around uh, that try to explain this puzzle. One is that people have very weak uh, privacy preferences or that they have all kinds of biases. And our explanation is a little different. So, so our idea is that this is based on a trust judgment. And this trust ju judgment means that even in contexts that were, that, where the objective risk might be exactly the same thing, and the context seems to be similar, people uh, decide uh, applying this heuristic make a trust judgment and they would trust the one party but not trust the other. So in one case they may reveal a lot of information and in the other they may reveal more or less nothing. So that, that looks like they make, make inconsistent choices but they have a reason why they do it and that's 
that's a heuristic. And there's also other things that we uh, think about that, that might drive these, uh, these choices, like that people have the feeling, as it goes to the public good character, that people have the feeling that once they have revealed this information to one party, they have revealed it more or less to everybody. Right? So that, that changes the cost structure. So sometimes it seems that they review this information uh, when the return is very small that they get for it. But the idea is well that they, they think of it as, as many choices where they get benefits from it. So they sell on eBay, they sell uh, with Amazon, and so they review this information uh, many times. And the idea is that like, the other party is going to share this information. And once you have revealed it, then this reduces the cost for, for future Okay. Yes, and the question is how to regulate that. Okay. And I guess this goes back also to the ascribed intentions because if you trust the party that is requesting the data, then you may be more willing to disclose it. Yeah, I mean, once you disclose it, right, um, it might be that you trust that party, but you think other parties might get access to it just because of the kind of sharing of information, mm -hmm. right? And so the marginal cost of disclosing it again falls. In, ter in terms of the question you ask about our baseline, so uh, the trick there that what we were trying to do was close off our action space. So what we wanted to do was make subjects perceive that we were without choices, that we did this because the law required us to. Now if we don't have an action space, you can't, you, you can't construct a counterfactual. Right, the counterfactual is, well, there's a world in which they couldn't have supplied us with this anonymous payment method. And so because they did, they were good, right? They can't do that, they're cut off. Um, uh, you know, like uh, every experiment, there's always this question of what are, what's people's actual cognition? And of course, we can't look inside their heads. All we can do is see how they behaved. The way they behaved is consistent with the idea that we did shut off that ascribed intention mechanism. But th that's all we know, we can't actually go further than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, please, uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so this question is for Professor Arnberg and Professor Sprigman. I, I was wondering to what extent, because both of you seem to find um, effects revolving around bright line rules, uh, whether you took into account or were interested in cognitive cost effects. So in the case of a startup founder or in the case of some, but potentially not all of your interview subjects, um, there's a, a well-known phenomenon where if people have lots of decisions to make, they try to make the more important decisions first, um, and whether, to what ex uh, whether and to what extent that might be affecting their preferences for, say, a, regu a person who is taking payment information but simply is following the law, or, for example, regu regulation, following the regulation, or simply trying to avoid learning about the regulation because they're afraid of what will happen. Sure. I mean, my experience with entrepreneurs is that they're, they're certainly not bad people who are trying to avoid regulations deliberately, but I mean, you've got uh, at a, in a startup maybe two or three people that are doing uh, the job of two dozen. And so as a result, there are, you're absolutely right, they're making a lot of decisions. And uh, within that realm of expertise, like what makes for a good entrepreneur rarely is someone who is, for one thing, not, not usually a lawyer. I mean, sometimes lawyers are good entrepreneurs, but there's some good data on that. Uh, they're like the 40th person you add to the team. So that particular type of regulatory uh, thinking and problem solving is usually not what it takes to get funded, to develop a product, to push to market, to drive sales, to attract venture capital. So part of it is that it's difficult decisions for, uh, and difficult information to be analyzed. And as we can see up here, some of these are difficult to analyze for attorneys that spend their, for, or you know, academics that, that study this for a living. So, it's, um, it's certainly true that when it's hard to make a decision, people will tend to avoid making that decision and to avoid even learning about the information. And that's why I think these pre-compliance programs are so helpful. Because, uh, and it's sort of like a sandbox, actually, as I sort of think it through, but you know, uh, it is a personalized approach. And the regulator is stepping in and saying, we're actually gonna tell you, you need more light switch covers. You need to, that your flame hood is you know, two inches too short. And um, they are coming in there telling you that and effectively giving you the uh, permission to do only those things. And my, uh, in, in, this, in this interview process, um, we found that uh, the, the entrepreneurs were very happy to do that and they saw the value in it. But if you give them a 300 page copy of the GDPR, they're simply not going to be able to comply with 
privacy regulations, and they won't do it. So I think really one really surprising thing from our study is that it's not it's not surprising that people tend to economize on decision making, right? They 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 try to reach decisions efficiently. So it's not surprising that in a low information environment, like in our first experiment, people resort to some form of heuristic to make this decision. This is inscribed intention heuristic, and probably in a lot of circumstances that's adaptive, right? It's just a subject to manipulation. What what is more surprising to me, and again, Stefan and I are in the this is, we're done with these experiments, but we're not done with this project, right? We've got more thinking to do. What, what's really surprising to me is that if you create a higher information environment where you give people more information, if they can use the heuristic, they'll use it and they'll ignore the information. So their, their tendency to economize on thinking will override their desire to get it right. They, they will leave valuable information sitting on the table in favor of the heuristic. Only when you basically cut out their ability to resort to the heuristic do they stop economizing and start focusing on accuracy or valuable information that might lead to accuracy. And that is, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how you would frame that. I mean, what I frame that as is the heuristic is very sticky, right? People want to be in that form of cognition unless they're forced not to be. If I could just... Briefly add on because something occurred to me. Um, so th this is why it's become a bit of a hobby horse for me to think about tort liability and the e economic loss rule. Um, you can have these top-down standards for things like privacy, um, and they can be bright line, but behavioral economics or um, a miscalculation of where you drew the bright, bright line because you were working under imperfect information as a regulator makes them very ineffectual and then hard to replace. And, just as someone with the sort of on the ground in DC pragmatic experience of, of rulemaking and lawmaking, it also takes forever, much, much longer here even than in Europe, especially given how things are in DC these days. The alternative, which is a sort of um, ex post rather than ex ante regulation, where you use something like tort law to presume duties among parties, and then when there are breaches, you look at whether there was negligence and breach and whether that caused the actual harm, it might be a better fit for this space. I, I, I'm not gonna be necessarily popular amongst uh, startup uh, founders because they've got this great anarchic space where right now they don't have to worry about tort liability as long as, as, long as they're not um, acting maliciously or with intent, they're just maybe being a little negligent and the damages would be purely economic because we're talking about something like a data breach, which is what Catherine Chucky's written primarily about on the economic loss rule is things like the target hack and things like this. All this payment information is held by intermediaries and there might be some incentives for them to be careful with it, um, but they're missing what is normally a very real incentive for people operating businesses to behave well, which is the looming specter of tort liability. And this is only gonna get worse as software, as Mark Andreessen says, eats the world. And now, like, what used to be a service provided by a company looks more like a service you get from a product, and maybe the only sensible way of regulating that is something like products liability. But it won't work if it's purely economic losses. I actually also want to follow on to Chris's point about the heuristics. And you know what we hear a lot about, I, I use the quote, a, re a reliance on Google law, and actually the availability of easy information that looks reliable is a big reason why entrepreneurs don't continue to search further. I don't know if you'd strictly call that a heuristic, but certainly the ability to quickly access information that appears reliable either from Google or from, you know, your fa pick your favorite blog or the VC podcast or what the startup in the, in the next door room in the incubator is doing. Um, yeah, they're, they're very hesitant to call. Lawyers are expensive, so, you know, uh, and, um, and they're, they're, they're unable to penetrate the regulations. So I think that easy, it's kind of ironic, but that easy access to information might actually preclude them from, from looking deeper because they think they have the answer. God knows we've published sort of instant analysis of our take on policy things and the community, you know, seizes on it and says, oh look, there's such a thing as a utility token, then that's not a security. As if like, it's a legal talisman. It's like it's the thing you get in the top Google search result. Um, but it's not a real legal analysis, and it definitely blinds entrepreneurs to, to the need to go deeper, I think. It's, it's, it's something I never expected when I first started working in this space, that our biggest problems would tend to be people's 
people in the community willing to buy essentially garbage <laughs> from as legal advice. Mm. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I uh, just wanted to jump in on the experiment a little bit. It's nice that you actually had the natural setting after the experiment. I liked that very much. But you know, on the baseline thing, right, and whether you muted it, uh, it looks like there is, I can see that that could actually work as a control group anyways. But you know, in a situation in which people have some sort of expectations on the possibility of being non-compliant with the law, right? So they expect companies, uh, that are, the companies actually have the opportunity of being non-compliant, right? You could still have that kind of factual, right? So it looks like when you say, well, we're required to do this by the law, right? There might be some sort of positive nudge. And I just wonder if you have thought about that. It's entirely possible. I mean, so there might be some kind of positive nudge, which would tend to make the distinction between uh, our um, good intent framing and our baseline smaller. So that has a somewhat ambiguous effect. So imagine we, because I think you're right, that some people might think, so these people are bound to be scofflaws. And so they do have actually an action space that isn't just compliance, it includes non-compliance. So remember on our baseline, they do understand that this is a university study done by scholars, so that they don't know as much about us as they will know later when we give them positive social cues, but they know enough about us to know, we hope, that our action space is pretty constrained. Now, assume for a moment that they don't believe that. They believe, you know, scholars mm -hmm. are, I don't know, they're, they're not Germans, they're Americans. They believe scholars <laughs> are rogues like everybody else, right? Um, um, so that would tend to, decrease the delta between baseline and po uh, good intent, and it would tend to increase the baseline between, uh, the delta between baseline and bad intent. It would have, it would tend to magnify our results with bad intent. It would tend to diminish our results with good intent. Um, it's ambiguous, right? So what, what we see is that the, there, there is no asymmetry, no, no notable asymmetry between the distance between baseline and good intent versus baseline and bad intent. They look roughly symmetrical. Um, and they're both significant. So possible, I, I doubt it's enough to affect our results, but I can't rule it out. Um, I'm, I, I was not fully sure whether this was change anything. So generally, I, I completely un, uh, uh, understand your point that the action space should include uh, non-compliance, but I'm not sure what it means in our study uh, because and our study, they're offering something positive. So compliance means that they offer a positive thing. And that's not, not clear how that could be non-compliant, right? So non-compliant would be, have to be something in their interest from which they can benefit. But they're offering something that's costly to them. And that appears to be compliance. I'm not, not but sure. But non-compliance would be something like it would be a second order phenomenon. Like the thing yeah. that we're offering isn't real. It would be something okay. like that. Oh, okay. So it wouldn't be that we're not really, it, it's, it, it's not, we are offering it, so it, it, it aligns with the story about what the law requires. It would have to be some second order thing, like what we're offering is a Which sham. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so we are going to f end five minutes early, but please join me in thanking all of our panelists for their. <laughs>